And welcome to a, another edition of Sanctified Reason. Sanctified Reason is a podcast where Dan does all myself side and sit at the crossroads of faith and pop culture and discuss the issues. Oftentimes we get influenced by Hollywood celebrities, musicians, people that are influencers on social media, and they tend to drive the narrative of societal beliefs and values. And so those are the things that we discuss. And Dan, one of the, I guess, latest stories that has become a little bit controversial is the movie Sound of Freedom. Now, the movie itself might not be so controversial because it deals with an actual true and factual event of human trafficking. But the movie-going experience has been quite interesting for some people. I've seen stories where people have been in the movie theater, and then all of a sudden the fire alarms go off, and then um, there's times where maybe the air conditioning dies and gets extremely hot, so they have to interrupt the movie, or pre-purchased tickets have been refunded for no reason, uh, movie cancellation times, um, just all kinds of things like that. And then, of course, initially, nobody wanted to pick up the film. It took them, I think, five years to finally release it. And now it's making a lot of money and headway at the box office. And so it's starting to gain a lot of traction, starring Jim Caviezel. And maybe you can uh, delve into it a little bit more as to what your experience was when you saw the movie. But Sound of Freedom, you know, talking about going after and rescuing kids that have been trafficked, you would seem or it would seem that people would think that's a great thing to do, but it's quite fascinating that Hollywood, some political elites and others are speaking out against it and trying to censor it, and it's almost like they're trying to say that human trafficking might be okay without saying it because of their actions and things that they're doing to oppose this movie. What was your thoughts on the movie when you saw it? Yeah, son. Uh, Tammy, my wife, and I uh, saw it. I thought the movie was very well done. Uh, it, uh, of course, presented a uh, critically important topic, uh, a tragic issue uh, in our day uh, where literally millions of children are, are being placed into a hell on earth uh, by being kidnapped and then uh, made uh, sex slaves. I mean, just about the worst possible scenario you can imagine. And as you say, Son, it's um, it's mind boggling that anyone would do anything to try to prevent this movie from get from getting the the widest uh, attention and notice possible. Uh, both my wife and I thought it was a very powerful film. Of course, Jim Caviezel is a tremendous actor. He's, he's just uh, a dedicated Christian uh, who, of course, played Jesus Christ in The Passion of the Christ. And, you know, for Jim Caviezel, um, this, is, this is just what his heart is all about, wanting to, uh, to reach people for Christ, in, in the case of this movie, wanting to reach children who are, who are uh, being trafficked. And, uh, you know, the only thing I can think of, Son, in terms of um, why some people seem just about, you know, opposed to this movie, um, to me, I just have to equate it with abortion. You know, I'll, I'll never understand how a human being can support the practice of abortion and the destruction of the most vulnerable among us. I'll never be able to relate to how someone can justify that uh, in their mind. Uh, it, it is so contrary to everything that um, not only we as, as Christians, of course, know to be uh, right, but you would think that just human beings in general would be repulsed by it, but you know, millions of children have been have been destroyed in the womb, and so I I, uh, I guess I just equate it to that, uh, in that I, I cannot understand how anyone would oppose Sound of Freedom or well, you know, l- let me say this too though, um, there are some people who seem to want to try to score political points with this movie, um, and 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 somehow paint. 
Um, you know, Tim Ballard, who the movie is about, uh, you know, in terms of the rescue of the children um, and try and turn this into some sort of, um, you know, ultra, you know, political, you know, QAnon, I guess they, they've accused him of, and, you know, conspiracy theories. Uh, I mean, this movie is not political. It's about children. And I, I think it just goes to show how you've got um, some very hardcore people on the left who will take anything that's generating attention. I mean, of course, we saw it with COVID for years. But, you know, it, it's often been said that the hard left will never let, you know, a calamity go to waste. Um, they'll always try to use it to score political points. And, 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 and that is so um, really disgusting when when you think about uh, the, the fact that there are people who seem more interested in power than in addressing um, human needs, uh, wh whether it be children coming across the border who are being trafficked because, um, you know, the left wants to keep an open border, um, even though many, many children go unaccounted for and the cartels and others are taking advantage of that. Um, you know, it, it, it's really uh, tragic to see um, how how that gets politicized when, you know, our concern should be for human beings and especially for children, especially for the vulnerable. Um, you know, it, it just it just boggles the mind. But I, I thought the movie was very well done. You know, someone asked me, son, if. If, if there were parts in the movie that were hard to watch and, and I think, you know, they were just wondering, I mean, how, how much did they show in terms of, um, you know, this, this topic and they were very, very tactful with that. They, they, they did nothing that even came close to showing, um, you know, a child actually being, you know, sexually abused, which you assume they would not have shown anything close to that. And they didn't. So they handled that very tactfully. You know, uh, people are left to just, you know, try to imagine the horror that these children go through and, and you don't even want to think about it. It's so um, just uh, revolting, uh, but, but they handled that aspect of it. Well, they, they really concentrated on, you know, just the whole, um, the whole topic of, of children being kidnapped and then what Tim Ballard and, and their team did to go in and rescue children. So, uh, you know, it's a very, very important movie. Um, obviously, you know, Christians, um, you know, line up on this issue, like, like we do on abortion and, and we're all for the protection of the children. And, and we just cannot fathom how you can have people who are pro-abortion, even up to the moment of birth. Um, that's as horrific, if not really more horrific, even, uh, I guess I would just say equally horrific to what's happening to children who are being trafficked. So we live in a very dark world where um, some human beings are choosing darkness over light. And I'm not only talking about those who are doing the trafficking, I'm not only talking about the abortion providers, but I'm talking about people who not only don't really seem to see a problem in that, but they'll go out of their way to um, to support uh, abortion and promote abortion and make it legal. And uh, I, this movie, I think, can go a long way, hopefully, in terms of opening eyes and and having people um, step up and and really try to address this this huge problem that, that we have. Yeah, you mentioned about um, late-term abortion. Maine, just recently, the governor, just in recent days, signed a bill that would allow abortion up to the moment of birth. And you think about that, okay, as a recent law that was just put into place. You think about, you know, Ghislaine Maxwell, who's sitting in prison somewhere, supposedly serving 20 years or something for sex trafficking of, of nobody, because nobody will let us know who was being trafficked. You have Jeffrey Epstein, who was murdered by suicide. You have the state of California with all kinds of laws that strip parents of their rights over their kids. Um, they are able to, kids are able to go to California from other states. And once they enter the state, then the 
jurisdiction of other courts in other states ends and California takes over and they're allowed to then rule against parents who are against gender transformation. Um, a lot of people are for this, you know, gender mutilation surgeries that they call gender affirming. Um, and so it goes on and on and on the assault on kids. First off, if you make it out of the womb, hey, good job. You should get a medal for that. Then you have to navigate childhood where everyone is trying to either attack you and make you get a sex change operation or they're going to stick you in front of some drag queen somewhere and expose you to sexual content in books and schools. And then if you make that, now you've got to navigate the world as an adult where you might get arrested and charged for felonies by using the wrong pronoun. I mean, this country has just completely gone upside down and is insane. But the question I have for you real quick, Dan, then you can, then you can, you know, mention or talk about whatever you want. But the question I have is the Bible specifically talks about children, you know, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for those of the kingdom of heaven, have the faith of a grain of a, uh, I mean, uh, the faith of a child. Um, it's mm-hmm. always talking about children, 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 you know? Right. And so is that, is there a correlation there that there's no coincidence that Satan is having people attack children because children are kind of a special person, a special entity in the Bible, and Jesus refers to them a little bit differently than he would maybe some adults? I think that's a very good point, Son, and I don't know that I've really thought too much about it, but as I'm thinking about it right now, um, I, I do think that there, there's definitely something to that. You know, just like um, there is something to the fact that there are those who hate Christ and hate Christians. Jesus said, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. So if there are people who will hate the perfect, sinless son of God, then why wouldn't there be people who would hate the most innocent, um, lovable human beings on the planet? And that's unborn children and then little children and infants, toddlers and the like. Um, you know, it, it's hard for us to fathom how anyone could could have anything but love and compassion for these little ones. The last thing we would ever uh, expect or think that a human being would do would, would be to try to harm one of these little children, but but it happens, and then there are those who turn a blind eye uh, to what is happening, and and you know you mentioned there in Maine, um, I mean how many politicians, how many uh, government officials are there who have voted uh, for the killing of the unborn? So I do think, son, I think there is a spiritual component to it. Uh, I I think in the case of hating Christ and hating Christians, um, you know, sinful man in, in his sinful heart doesn't even understand why uh, he hates Christ, if, if that's what's in his heart. And it is clearly in the hearts of many. Uh, he doesn't even understand why he hates Christians. Uh, but, but that's the direction that uh, that our flesh, our sinful nature goes. The world uh, will often head in that direction. Um and 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 of course the devil is tempting people to go in that direction. So I suppose it shouldn't surprise us that if the sinless Son of God is hated so badly, and and Christians who are just trying to help other people are hated so badly uh, that uh, you know it just stands to reason then in line with that uh, you know that fact that there would be those who would um, who would hate and abandon uh, little ones. You know, I'm reminded of a couple uh, missionaries uh, in India. We would have Pastor Vijay come and share with us about his work there in India, and he told us about two uh, men who um, he had trained, Daniel and Isaac, and uh, they were serving among the poorest of the poor in Calcutta, and they felt called to go to that area and spread the gospel. But there were some radical Hindus in that area who didn't want them there, and they warned them, don't come back. You know, we don't want you and your message here. And all they were doing was just loving the people, helping the people, the poorest of the poor in the world. Well, they felt God was calling them to continue going back. And so they did. Well, they ended up getting kidnapped uh, by these uh, radical uh, Hindus. 
and they were uh, put into burlap bags, and they actually had hot oil poured on them, and they were left on the side of the road. I mean, uh, you can't even imagine a more atrocious death than what they endured, and they both died. Um, And for what? For wanting to help children and their parents and their families, the poorest of the poor. Uh, but but when people get this anti-Christ, anti-Christian um, idea in their mind, this fervor for some other religion that, that leads them to, to hate Christ and to hate Christians, and, and we see it in various examples around the world, uh, people are willing to do anything to destroy uh, the, the messengers. And I'll tell you, son, um, as as incredible as it sounds, the wives of Daniel and Isaac um, decided to carry on the work right there in the areas where their families had been ministering, where their husbands had been uh, brutally killed. Um, they felt led to stay, and I, you know, I haven't heard any more to that story. I, we we hope and pray that those those women, those wives who were carrying on their husbands' work um, and the work that they were doing, because they were doing it as a team. It wasn't only their husbands, but they were involved in the work, obviously, before their husbands died. They continued the work that they were doing um, as they were teaming up with their husbands uh, in this important work. And, uh, you know, it, it just boggles the mind. But, you know, Jesus said, you know, bless are you when, when, when men persecute you, for great is your reward in heaven. And, and so we know that eternal life in heaven is a free gift through faith in Christ. We also know that Jesus talked about heavenly rewards for the faithful. So you don't get in by your works, but those who are getting in, uh, like Daniel and Isaac, who got in by grace, not by works, they got in through faith in Jesus, um, they will nevertheless be rewarded in some way for for what they endured, and and Jesus talked about these uh, future rewards. Just like in hell, there will be degrees of punishment, and and the Bible uh, makes that clear, that that, that some will have uh, a worse punishment than others, which just, that, that would seem to fit with God's justice, wouldn't it? That, that someone like Hitler will, will, would be punished far more severely than, 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 let's say, someone who, you know, maybe they just lived their life and didn't know anything about Jesus. And, and uh, but, you know, let's, let's say that, for example, uh, someone came and presented the gospel to them late in their life, and they they declined. They didn't want it, and they died, and 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 they didn't go to heaven. You know, they 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 go to hell. Um, but will will they be punished as severely as Hitler? It, it certainly doesn't seem so biblically. It, it, it seems like there will be degrees of punishment. Um, I believe uh, you know Jesus uh, addressed that, although the Bible doesn't say a lot about that. Uh, likewise, there will be uh, varying. De- uh, you know, rewards in heaven. Uh, everyone in heaven will be thrilled. No one will be jealous of someone else's rewards. But, you know, for Daniel and Isaac, um, they will be rewarded for their faithfulness. The Bible makes that clear. And there's a biblical distinction between gift and reward. Eternal life in heaven is a free gift. But there are various times when Jesus talked about great is your reward in heaven. Um, and so a reward is based on something you've done. A gift is is not. And, and so you can't earn your way to heaven. It's critical that people understand that. You cannot earn your way. You cannot work your way. Um, you can only be, come in as a free gift. But having said that, um, there are going to be heavenly rewards. You know, in Corinthians, it talks about our works being tested by fire and and how some people's works will be burned up like wood, hay, and stubble. And so they'll get into heaven, but only as one escaping through the flames. In other words, like the, the, the flames of, of, of their, their, their works being tested. You know, it's interesting, son. Maybe, I don't know, perhaps the Catholic Church, you know, gets purgatory from that, that teaching. Well, that, that, that doesn't teach that people go to a place and, and then somehow maybe have to suffer there or something like that. Uh, no, that's not at all what the Bible teaches. Um, you, you don't go to purgatory before heaven. Um, but, but the Bible does say that your works are tested with fire. So in that sense, um, you know, it, it, there is, there is that, that, that testing that happens. Um, and, and for those works that were done for noble purposes and for the glory of God and, and not for one's, you know, personal recognition. It refers to those works as, um, you know, gold and silver and costly stones. In other words, 
those will pass the test of the flames and there'll be a reward. Whatever that reward is, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think we have to be careful that we don't think of it in terms of like the way we, we might think of a reward here on earth. Uh, you know, we, we, we tend to think of like maybe a monetary reward or I'm going to get something. And, and I don't know what those rewards in heaven will be. Um, but, but I know it will bring God glory. I know it will be very fulfilling and satisfying. I know it will be very God focused. And it will be very satisfying to um, Daniel and Isaac and all those who have made sacrifices for the gospel. And, and Jesus has promised to reward them um, there in heaven. Great will be your reward in heaven. So if a person's ever trying to figure out the, the difference between, you know, heavenly rewards, punishments in hell, you know, do I earn heaven? No, you don't earn heaven. It's a free gift. You only get it through repentance and faith in Christ. But 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 then your works will be tested with fire. And those things that you've done to just draw attention to yourself or, uh, you know, as a Christian now, those things you've done as a Christian that uh, maybe weren't really done for a noble purpose, those will be burned up like wood, hay, and stubble. There'll be no reward for that. But, but the Bible says you will escape, but only as one, um, you know, escape to the flames. In other words, you're not going to go to hell because as a Christian, maybe you did some things to try to draw attention to yourself, but you're not going to be rewarded for that. Um, and, and, and again, I don't know what that reward is, but, you know, read, read Paul's description on that. Um, you know, it, it, it's very clear that you'll receive your reward for the, uh, the gold and silver and costly stones. In other words, those things that were done like what Daniel and Isaac did. Now, you don't have to necessarily only be ministering to the poorest of the poor. I mean, that's a very great work, but there are lots of good works that Christians can do. Um, there are many good works that Christian nurses perform in a hospital or, or Christians perf perform in their community um, or in their own family, or maybe even when they're lying in a hospital bed and, and suffering some terrible disease, but the Holy Spirit is producing his fruit in their life um, and the patience, the, the, just their endurance. I I, I think about a man in our church right now, Luther, uh, who's in the hospital and has, has undergone tremendous uh, health issues over the years, but the, the faith that he has modeled through that uh, is just incredible. And I believe he'll be rewarded for that because it, it, it's been very noble uh, the way he has maintained his faith in Christ and witnessed for the Lord, uh, even though he's had a very hard go of it for years. So there are many different uh, things and ways to uh, to work for the Lord. Um, wherever you're at, you can work with prayer. You know, if, if you're um, bedridden, if you're homebound, uh, and, and you can't, you know, let's say go to church, be around people, um, go out and work in the community, but in your home, in your bed, you're bedridden, but you can pray and, and you're praying for, for lost people. You're praying for your family. You're praying for the needs of the nation and of the world. So there are lots of things you can do. Um, and, and, uh, the Lord wants us doing those things because we have been saved to do good works. Um, we weren't saved by our good works. That never, it never works that way, but we're saved to do good works. And, and it's the people who are relying on their good works to get into heaven who are not saved. But when you look at that movie, Sound of Freedom and Jim Caviezel, and, and you listen to him, uh, you know, in interviews, you know, it's obvious, Son, that he wants the focus to be on the Lord. He wants people to know Christ. And in the case of this movie, he desperately wants to, to help rescue trafficked children. And, you know, praise the Lord that, that this movie is out and that it, it's getting a wide audience. And now we just pray that um, the impact will be huge and, and that nations and governments and people all around the world will step up and try to stamp out just this this ugly, vicious practice uh, um, and, and, and to hunt down uh, those who are carrying it out, um, to put all the money necessary uh, toward that. And wouldn't it be amazing if, like, for example, um, people who want to spend billions of dollars here in our country, um, you know, for the climate. OK, hey, yeah, we want a good climate. You know, we want to we want to protect the environment. Um, but what's more important? 
you know, as, as China and all these other nations are pumping, you know, all sorts of pollutants into the atmosphere. And, you know, yes, do, do your part here in America. But I mean, children are dying. I mean, you shouldn't be spending at least as much money on child trafficking as you are on, on, on climate issues. Uh, you know, uh, if you happen to feel that that really is, is a problem that can be addressed, which, you know, many people don't, of course. Uh, but, but I'm just saying, even for those who seem convinced of that, um, why can't, why can't can't they put at least as much money toward child trafficking and, and against abortion and for children in the womb? Um, why is it these other issues um, that, that do not uh, at all rise to the level of, of protecting the vulnerable, protecting the innocent, um, whether it be children crossing the border unaccompanied because the border is open and there's no order on the border. So you have more and more children being trafficked in that situation. You know, there are lots of things you can do, but at the end, of the day, son, if you don't have a love for children in your heart, you're probably not going to do it. And you're going to side with the climate over children every time. You're going to side with abortion over, you know, pro-life issues. And when a movie like this one comes out, Sound of Freedom, um, you, you, you may not show any interest in that. In fact, you might even uh, do, like some of these examples you gave, almost things to undermine it. Or, or, or to, uh, you know, I, I heard a couple uh, news reports of, uh, of some leftists who were just trying to associate the, the directors with, you know, conspiracy theories and things. Again, um, they're, they're not showing an ounce of compassion for the traffic children when they try to politicize something that is clear really not a political movie at all. It, 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 it's about the children. Going back to your, really your question here, Son, about what Jesus said about children, and is there a spiritual component to what we see? I definitely believe there is. You know, Dan, I was watching a video one time. Okay, so the movie came out, and um, it led me to Operation Underground Railroad, which is the website that is designed to kind of bring it's on YouTube, but it's it's the organization that Tim Ballard was about um, when rescuing children from sex trafficking. And as you kind of scroll through some of the videos, they had some things on there that were kind of warnings to maybe parents and other people about how modern-day trafficking happens. Obviously, in the movie, it was kind of like a Taken. If you've seen the movie Taken, it was kind of like a Taken-esque type of thing. Someone kidnapped, and you got to go rescue them in another country. And so the stereotype of you know the movie Taken has pretty much uh, superseded the reality of what human trafficking is about. And there was a lot of videos on there of people that were not even kidnapped. They're in their own communities, and they're being extorted into sex crimes, mm-hmm. you know, just in their community threatening yeah. grandma if you don't come and do this type of activity and so there's all kinds of sex trafficking going on that doesn't even include kidnapping doesn't even include taking somebody someplace else they they take them for an hour and then they send them back you know things like that but one of the things that one of the videos i watched showed is social media had some kids talking about their use of social media and some would say they were on there from anywhere between two to three hours, four to five hours, six hours, whatever. Lots and lots of time on social media and the influences of social media. And so they were warning about the people on the other end, you know, the groomers and people like that that might be trying to get to your kids through social media. But when you take at the take a look at the world, society, and we've talked about the, the sex trafficking. We've talked about, you know, the abortion, the transgender. We've talked about, you know, climate change. Whatever it is, the influence of social media tends to be very strong because people spend so much time on it. And so imagine if people were able to swap that and instead of spending hours on social media, spend hours reading the Bible in prayer, things Uh like that, you might Uh see a vastly, in fact, you would see a vastly different world. How is it, or what can be done, do you think, I know I'm throwing this at you kind of the last minute, because it just kind of came to me, but what can be done to combat the influence, which is a negative one, by all aspects, I've done a lot of research on social media, being in the education field, I've done all kinds of research on social media, and everything comes back to social media is dangerous. It has some good, but a majority of it is dangerous and hazardous for mental health, for personal mm-hmm. safety. I mean, goes on and on and on. The 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 benefits of yeah. it are very minimal. 
what can be done, you know, to combat that influence <clears throat> that the church can do or other believers can do or, mm-hmm. and, and if you want to take religion out of it, what can just good people do to combat that negative influence uh, for those that, you know, want to do something about it? I mean, I think that's something that needs to probably be considered or thought about because of the mm-hmm. amount of time that the negative influence they're receiving through social media, because like you mentioned, a lot of people think that, oh, sex trafficking might not be that bad because it doesn't happen here. Or, you know, gender affirming surgery is not that bad because everybody's doing it. Or, oh, they're over there are transgendered. So I think I'm going to be that too. Or I believe this. And so, or like you mentioned the QAnon, I did a, a brief look on what that was. And I still can't figure out what it is. It's some made up thing that some guy who was anonymous going by the name of Q put on social media and now everyone believes it to be factual. And so again, there, the whole theory of QAnon was spread through social media and it was basically just, you know, false information. But anyways, back to the original question, any thoughts on what could be done to kind of combat that uh, influence that social media has on people, especially the young and influential people of our country, our society? Yes, uh, it's a great question, and I I think ultimately it comes down to um, seeing a person's appetite change where they begin to crave uh, the spiritual milk of the Word of God and and they begin to grow in the gospel, which is the the dynamite power of God. Um, because I think of it this way, son. Like let, let's say you had an orphanage, and you had a hundred children in the orphanage, and let's just say they're all you know somewhere between let's say four and seven years old. Okay, and let's say every day you know with the three meals that you serve, um, you know. Ninety-eight percent of the food that's available for the children, and they they could let's say could could decide what they wanted to eat each day. Ninety-eight percent of it, let's just say, was was junk food. Uh, so breakfast, lunch, and dinner, ninety-eight percent junk food. And then let's say two percent of it um, there is very healthy food that they need. But they may not be mature enough, and even if they were mature enough to understand the difference of of, of the effect of, of that food on them, um, they, they they may not, um, for whatever reason, decide to go with the healthy food, and they might just choose to live on on junk food because it's readily available, it, it tastes good. Um, and and they don't have to delay any you know gratification. They can instantly have their their appetite satisfied with this junk food, and and yet they're worse off for it. Obviously, so that's kind of I, I think the the situation we're in here in society. Let's just take America, although you could talk about this in many places of the world. But you, you you've got social media. And so much of what's on there is junk food for the soul. Uh, it will not provide an ounce of nourishment. It will only kind of titillate your mind. It, it will, um, uh, it will, uh, you know, just uh, give you some sort of little uh, buzz, maybe some adrenaline, uh, maybe some enjoyment because of the um, the, the story itself, uh, the content of it. But it, it does nothing to feed the soul. You know, in order for the soul to be fed, um, a person needs to hear and then believe the gospel. Uh, the good news of salvation that God loved us so much that even though we're sinful, he sent his only son to die for us so that everyone who repents of their sin and calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Um, that's how the spirit comes alive within a person. And that's how a person begins to develop an appetite for the word of God. Now you've got some people who are not yet saved who devour the word, um, but but it's 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 not the pure word because they're being given false doctrine. I think, for example, like say Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay, so if they come to your door and if you were to engage uh, in a discussion with them, um, they quote all kinds of Bible verses. But what they don't have is they don't have the gospel. They don't know the gospel. Um, they've been taught a uh, a false doctrine, a false message, and and they believe that by going 
going out and, and uh, knocking on doors and talking to people, they are earning their way to heaven. So, I, you know, that's, that's uh, a situation where you do have Bible verses involved, but you don't have spiritual power. Um, you have a cult, you, you have a, a, a false religion. Um, but I'm talking about a, a hunger for the Bible, uh, similar to what, uh, the Puritans had, um, you know, when you, when you think about, you know, the earliest days of this nation, um, and then when, when you think about the fact, Son, that the first schools in our nation, uh, the main textbook was the Bible. Why? Be- because um, most of the people were saved. They were spiritually reborn. They were hungry for the word, and they knew that their children needed the word of God. In fact, Martin Luther, 500 years ago, uh, you know, he, he made the statement that, you know, he was afraid that any educational institution that doesn't center on the word of God will ultimately um, end up serving the gates of hell. And boy, were his words ever prophetic uh, in those public schools today that are um, obsessed with cramming transgenderism uh, down the, the throats of, of children um, and, and, and trying to indoctrinate them in LGBTQ uh, propaganda. And, and what's the fruit of that? Well, it, we had a report in the last couple weeks that one of the Ivy League schools Brown University, which, by the way, the Ivy League schools were started hundreds of years ago to promote the gospel and spread the gospel. That's why they they began, you know, Harvard and Yale and Dartmouth and such. But um, Brown University, uh, now uh, nearly 40 percent of the students at Brown University identify as LGBTQ which is mind boggling. Now, how many of them are just claiming that label because they feel peer pressure, they feel they fit in, they feel it's going to make them more popular. I mean, obviously a certain percentage of them because, uh, you know, there certainly aren't 40% of them. Uh, it, it wouldn't seem that are, um, feeling, uh, feeling led to engage in, um, same sex relationships or transgenderism. Uh, we don't know for sure how many of them are. I mean, you know, for a long time in our nation, it was maybe one to 2% of people. Um, what is it today? I don't know. I mean, some would even say maybe less than 1% at one point, but, but, um, why, why is that? Because of the propaganda that's been pushed on, uh, on people. So, um, if you eat junk food when you're young, if you eat spiritual junk food and, and ideological junk food, um, the result is what you have there at Brown University. Um, rather than students who identify as Christians wanting to spread the gospel in the tradition of the Ivy League schools going way back, um, now you, you have essentially a different religion that they're promoting. And it is a, it is a religion for those who wave the banner and, and have the pride parades. And I mean, it is a religion religion for them. They, they, they may not use the term God, but they are very, very religiously um, devout in their adoration of this ideology and, and in rejecting God's design for marriage and God's design for sexuality and God's design for gender. They reject all of that. And they say, no, our way is better. Um, forget man and woman in marriage as, as being the, um, the only way to, um, uh, to practice, uh, you know, or to engage in sex in a way that is, is, is wholesome. No, they, they've reinvented that and, and they, they've perverted God's design. And, and so to go to your question, son, I, I think ultimately the appetite has to be changed, um, because there's always going to be junk out there. Um, I mean, now with social media and, and the internet and everything else, um, you know, and cable TV, I mean, it's going to continue to be everywhere. You know, it's kind of like with drugs. Okay. With, with drugs being everywhere, you know, um, how are you going to, how are you going to really stop that? You, you know, you may not be able to stop the flow of drugs into the country. Uh, it's only when people begin to crave something more than they, than they want the drug. I, I remember when I did the uh, Bible study here at the County jail for five years and I, I met a man, 
David, who had been addicted to cocaine for, for a number of years, and he said the closest thing he could compare it to in terms of when he really just had to have cocaine um, is, he said, it's like if you're underwater and you have to have oxygen, you have to come up for air. And that has really stuck with me uh, that, uh, you know, if the, if the compulsion, if the addiction is that strong, um, it clearly has to be broken by by the Lord. It's not going to be an easy thing to break. Um, certainly the devil is involved um, when, when people give themselves over to something like that. But, but you have to change the appetite. And, and it's that way whether a person is hooked on cocaine or hooked on pornography or hooked on LBGTQ ideology or hooked on transgenderism um, or, or drawn to anything sinful. You know, the Bible says a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. Um, and there are many sinful things that will master a person's mind and heart and soul. And many of them are on social media today. The only thing that can break that up is the dynamite of God, the gospel. And the apostle Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. It is the dynamis, the Greek word. So the dynamite, the dynamis, the power of God, the dynamite of God. So you've got to have that worldview and those appetites blown up um, through, through Christian conversion. And uh, the Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. How so? Well, now your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Christ is now dwelling within you. You now have new desires that you never had before. You now have a new awareness that you never had before. Now you understand that the cross is, is what saves you, not your works, not knocking on doors, you know, certainly not the false doctrines of a cult, you know, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, but the pure gospel message of Scripture, um, which has been around, well, 2,000 years for Christianity and thousands of years before that in the Old Testament, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormonism came on the scene 200 years ago uh, with their false prophets. Interestingly, son, I was talking one time uh, here a few months back with a young man uh, who is a Mormon and a very, very smart young man. But uh, I asked him, I said, hey, you know, um, what would you think if, if, if a religion had a leader or a prophet that was sleeping around with a bunch of women, including um, even some teenage girls, and, you know, an older man, let's say, as, as, your, as your prophet? Well, he, he thought, no, he, he wouldn't want anything to do with that. And yeah, and I said, well, I mean, do you think God would ever deliver truth through someone like that? He said, no, he didn't think so at all. But then I asked him, I said, well, I mean, you know, and I, I tried to do it very tactfully, but I said, I mean, are you aware that the, uh, the, the, the first two prophets of the Mormon uh, religion, Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, between the two of them, they had about 100 wives, um, some of whom were teenagers. And, and, and so um, these men were, um, were predators. They were predators. But they were lifted up by their by their denomin by their you know their religious group as some noble leader. Um, but not only was was the doctrine so bad and so unbiblical, but the fruit of their lives should have been enough to warn people: um, you can't trust these guys. Go with Jesus. Go with the Apostle Paul, who wrote two thirds of the New Testament. But don't believe this new message. That, that that these two new groups who've only arrived on the scene, you know, I mean, what, some 1,800 years after Jesus was born and after the New Testament uh, and the Christian church began, don't be deceived by these false doctrines, which, by the way, both of those groups, on they get the gospel wrong and they get the nature of God wrong. They redefine Jesus. They, they, they say he's a created being rather than the eternal God, along with the Father and the Holy Spirit. That is absolutely wrong. And they teach salvation by works. And so they don't have the gospel. They don't have the dynamite, the power of God. Um, so Satan has, you know, he, he's pulled out every trick, you know, he can to try to deceive people, to pull them into false doctrine, false living. Um, and, you know, so that people don't you know, realize it's not just the cults like Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. You've got mainline denominations, um, you know, Methodist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, certain aspects of those denominations where the leadership. Uh, has come out in favor of 
of endorsing um, homosexual behavior um, and and affirming that and and affirming the marriage of, of 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 two men and two women. So it's not only the cults that have been deceived uh, in our world today. It's also um, those so-called uh, Christian denominations that have abandoned the Bible. They've abandoned God's plan for uh, sexuality. They've abandoned God's plan for gender. They've abandoned God's plan for marriage between a man and a woman. Um, so it's not only Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses that you got to watch out for. I mean, we stop and think about it. Son. No wonder Jesus said the road is narrow, you know, uh, and, and the wide Wide road that leads to destruction is, in fact, wide. Be- because if it's not LGBTQ, uh, like you were saying before, son, if, if it's not, you know, the stuff they're pushing at kids, I mean, if you make it out of the womb, like you said, you know, praise the Lord, if you make it past the abortion mill, um, if you make it through, if you if you get sent to a, a, a public school that happens to be a place where you've got teachers trying to indoctrinate kids in LGBTQ ideology, if you make it through that, you know, I mean, you, you see why kids need loving Christian parents who will teach them the truth. You can see why so many families are turning to homeschooling, you know, be, be, be because, um, uh, or Christian, a uh, Christian school, be, because who wants their kids in doctrine? I was just looking at an article today, so I didn't even read it. It's just kind of so disturbing, but and this young boy, I guess, apparently, who, um, you know, decided he was a girl and, and the headline talked about him being castrated. But now he's trying to warn other kids that, you know, don't be duped by his transgenders. How tragic. Um, you know, but, but will the will the mainstream media, will, will they put him out there? Some will, a few will. Uh, but there are so many in the media who seem to want to hide that, hide that for people. Why? If you care about kids, why would you hide that? Why would you hide the sound of freedom? Why would you hide? Um, what's going on with abortion, you know, um, if you truly care for people. So at times, son, it may seem to Christians like, um, you know, we're, we're a lone voice, but but there are there are quite a few like us. I mean, you know, uh, granted, there are, you know, hundreds of millions, you know, in our country and, and of course, in the world. But um, we need and we have people like Jim Caviezel speaking out. Um, we have, you know, Christians speaking out. But um, when you've got, you know, 40 percent of your student body, you're almost 40% at Brown University identifying as LGBTQ. You say, my goodness, um, have they have they fallen a long way from the, the origins of the Ivy League schools, of the Puritans? Um, and, and of course, son, there are those who are so duped that all they want to focus on um, are, are the mistakes that have taken place in America in the past, rather than trying to fix the current problems. And, and you know, I just find it interesting that, that those who hate um, Christianity many times if they're Americans, they also can tend to hate America and vice versa. Um, I don't know. It's just kind of an interesting correlation. Um, if you hate Christ, you're going to hate America. If you hate America, you're, you're, you're not really going to have much of an interest in Jesus. I don't know. It's just like that hatred seems to feed on itself. Um, and I think it has to do with freedom, you know, because Jesus was free. The, the Pharisees hated him. Uh, Christianity promotes freedom. And, and those who have the spirit of, of the enemy in them, they hate freedom. And and when you hate freedom, you're going to hate America because America is a free nation and you're going to do whatever you can to undermine it. So America is not heaven. Um, God is not trying to establish uh, a national religion led by the government, you know, or something like that. You know, heaven forbid. Um, God is on a much higher level than that. But but we live in a free nation that, um, you know, many Christians have helped. I mean, they've, they've, you know, shed their blood, given their lives for the freedoms that we have. And, and those who hate freedom tend to hate children, you know, tend to want to cover up, you know, things like the sound of freedom and, and what's going on with abortion and, and even what's going on, say, with Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. I mean, there's all sorts of deception out there and only the Bible, you know, you Christians, you're so arrogant. What makes you think you're right? Well, Jesus was right. Okay. It's not about what we think. It's only what Jesus says. It's what the Bible says. That's what's right. And that's what our nation began with song. That's why we were free. That's why we didn't have these problems. You know, a hundred years ago, uh, you know, they, they, they started to kick in 
when, when all of these bad uh, these bad ideas uh, started, you know, flowing out of the sexual revolution of the '60s, and the dominoes started to fall, and so-called free sex. Well, just reading a report today. I mean, you know, just the syphilis outbreak in um, where was this? Um, uh, anyway, but it, you know, I mean, but it's that's been going on since the '60s. You know, um, so it's not free sex. You know, there's no such thing as free sex. Uh, and and of course, when that domino fell, then the next domino to fall was was same sex. You know, and 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 the comedians started to joke about it on late night, and and you know, hey, this is good. We need to have this. We need to do this. Um, well, uh, yeah. And then what did that lead to? Uh, when when you abandon God's design, well, that led to transgenderism. You know, so there's no end. And and what that leads to ultimately is is even even you know uh, more things. I mean, the Bible addresses things like bestiality and other things. You know, you've already got some people wanting to promote adult children. Um, you know, sexual relationships. You know, man boy love. You know. Uh, uh, th- that just flows from that same spirit, that LGBT spirit. Uh, I'm not saying everybody in LGBT would, would 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 promote that, but I'm just saying that's what led to transgenderism. That's what leads to these even even more uh, you know unspeakable acts. Um, and and so our only hope, son, is the gospel, getting a new heart, getting new appetites, and we're not going to be able to stop the flood on social media. Um, but what we can do is give a person, just like somebody who's on drugs, we can give them a new, God can give them a new appetite where it's still going to be available, but they're, they're going to be able to say no to that. I don't want that. That will destroy me. It was destroying me. Now I'm, I'm hungry. I'm, I'm hungry and thirsty for righteousness. I'm hungry and thirsty for the gospel. I'm hungry and thirsty for the Holy Spirit to fill me every day. I'm hungry and thirsty for the word of God, like Jeremiah, who said, when your words came, I ate them. So I think that ultimately is the answer to your question, Son, on how do we address that. And 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 Paul said, when I was with you, he said, I, re- I resolved to know nothing with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So as important as, as some political issues and social issues are to address, and they need to be addressed, ultimately, um, I mean, Paul's message was the gospel, and, and, and he stuck to that. Even with all the cultural issues of his day, all the political issues of his day, I asked our folks at Bible study the other night, I said, you know, let's just think, can we think of one time in the Bible where Paul addressed even one uh, local political issue? Um, and, 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 and so, you know, we, we, we talked about that. I mean, obviously, thankfully, Son, Christians addressed the problem of slavery, William Wilberforce and others. Now, now it took many years, uh, and, and you had professing Christians who, who weren't addressing that, uh, but but it finally did get addressed. Um, I'm not saying we don't address those issues. We're, we're doing that in this podcast, aren't we? Uh, all I'm saying is, at the end of the day, um, the thing that's going to change hearts is the gospel. That's what Paul centered on. That's, that's our dynamite. I mean, we, we, we can talk about a lot of concerns things as Christians. Um, we can we can talk about why, you know, a, a conservative approach is better in this and that and that. But at the end of the day, if we don't give someone the gospel, if they don't believe the gospel, if they don't get a new heart, then we haven't really helped them in the long run. And and what made America great, okay, not perfect, you know, and not, not without without major flaws, but what made America great in in, in many respects, the freedom uh, was 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 the Bible. And those who want to just throw America under the bus because of the uh, horrific practice of slavery, um, yes, it was horrific. Yes, it was terrible. Um, but the question is, um, are we only going to live in the past, or are, you know, what, what about what about the, the slavery of, of children today? You know, um, what about the sex slavery of those children? Isn't that as bad as, as the horrid practice of of slavery in the past? So, so both are terrible, um, and. Uh, and I think the people who are filled with the Holy Spirit are going to try to um, stop slavery wherever it's going on and, and try to point people to Christ. So um, we need the gospel. The gospel changes lives. And, and thankfully, son, that's what the Lord's given us to, to, to give to the world. Dan Dozell with us as we talk about movie Sound of Freedom and the human trafficking and other things that have been developing over the last little bit based on that film and Dan, we appreciate your time and insight as always, and uh, we look forward to uh, many more conversations, God willing. Well, I look forward to that as well. Thank you so much, Son. Yes. 
And for those of you listening, you can check out our website at RadioWarp.com. That's Radio W-A-R-P, RadioWarp.com. And you can click the Sanctified Reason podcast logo. And past shows will pop up, and you can check them out. You can also uh, reach out via our email, SanctifiedReasonPodcast at gmail.com. That's SanctifiedReasonPodcast at gmail.com. And for those of you listening, hey, thanks for listening. Do tell a friend. And until next time, God bless.